Hello and welcome to worship at Glendale First United Methodist Church uh, for this Sunday, September 29th. We are closing out our sermon series called Uncommon Wisdom uh, and hope that you are able to uh, experience the presence of God through this wherever you are watching uh, and however you are able to experience uh, this worship service. And we thank you for being here. So let us begin our time of worship as we uh, worship together. I wanna welcome you to Glendale First Methodist Church. And we have just a couple announcements today. First of all, I wanna mention the Halloween trunk and treat, which is gonna happen October 27th on a Sunday evening and afternoon. And for those of you who have cars and wanna decorate and open up your trunk and have a bunch of treats for the kids that come by, we welcome you to come and join us and participate in this great little event. So that's October 27th, the trunk or treat, and we expect to see you there and have a lot of kids coming and enjoying this festivity. Also, I wanna also thank every one of you who is contributing to this ministry here at Glendale First. This is very important to the, the welfare and the ministry of not only this church, but this neighborhood, this community. So we thank you for your tithes and offerings. If you'd like to donate, just go to glendalefirst.org and follow the prompts and you can either do a monthly contrib contribution or you can just do a one-time contribution. But whatever you do, we are very, very grateful for your donation. Thank you so much. The reading for today is from the book of Esther in the Old Testament. That's chapter seven, verses one through six, nine and 10, and then chapter nine, verses 20 through 22. So the king and Haman went to the feast with Queen Esther. On the second day, as they were drinking wine, the king again asked to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to half of my kingdom it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, if I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given to me. That is my petition. And the lives of my people, that is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace. But no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he? Who has presumed to do this? Esther said, A foe, an enemy, with this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, look, the very pole that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, stands at Haman's house, 50 cubits high. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hung Haman on the pole that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the anger of the king abated Mordecai recorded these things and sent letters to all the Jews who were in all the providences of King Ahasuerus, both near and far, enjoining them that they should keep the 14th day of the month, Adar, and also the 15th day of the same month, year by year, as the days on which the Jews gained relief from their enemies, and as the month that they had been turned for them from sorrow into gladness and from mourning into a holiday that they should make them days of feasting and gladness, days for sending gifts of food to one another and presents to the poor. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this is our last Sunday in our Uncommon Wisdom series. And today we are looking at uh, some passages from the story of Esther. Our sermon is titled, For Such a Time. Let's pray. Wise and knowing God, be with us in this time of reading and interpreting your word. Open our minds to your wisdom, our hearts to your grace, and our spirits to your Holy Spirit, that we may hear what you would have to teach us this day about who you are and who you call us to be as your disciples. Amen. So over the last several weeks, we've been looking at scriptures in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament that are often called the wisdom literature. We looked at Song of Solomon, Proverbs, Psalms, and today we arrive at the book of Esther. 
Our scripture from the lectionary is a selection of a few verses, but the entire book of Esther uh, is quite fascinating. I highly recommend you read the whole thing on your own uh, because Esther really seems like more of a short novel, a novella than a book of the Bible, especially because God is not mentioned once by name in the book of Esther. We don't have time to read the whole thing, so I'll give you a quick summary of what happens in this story. And so it starts in the Persian Empire, which at the time is ruled by Xerxes I. He ruled Persia from 486 to 465 BCE. And so in this story, Xerxes is throwing this big meeting of all of the rulers from the different provinces in Persia, and he's having this party with them. And toward the end of this party, uh, he gets pretty drunk, it says, and decides that he wants to parade his queen around in front of everyone. Um, this would, of course, have been very uh, degrading and disrespectful for her, so she refuses. Xerxes is upset by this, uh, and he also appears to be pretty hapless and very easily manipulated because his advisors then convince him to banish her they tell him that if he lets his wife disobey him, then all of the wives in the kingdom will start disobeying their husbands. And if that starts happening, then, you know, they're all going to hell in a handbasket, as my grandmother would say. So Xerxes listens to these advisors. He sends his king away, but then pretty quickly he gets lonely. And so these same advisors tell him that they will go find him a new queen. So they essentially uh, kidnap a bunch of women from the kingdom who are unmarried and lock them in this palace for months and have them undergo, it says, special skin treatments. They're put on some kind of special diet. Uh, and then they are taken to the king at night, uh, one by one, until he decides which one he likes the best. He ends up choosing Esther. Uh, and it seems the way that uh, he talks about her in this book that he just falls head over heels for her, fawning all over her, uh, you know, just really in love or at least infatuated with Esther. But he doesn't know that Esther is Jewish, nor that she is the cousin and adopted daughter of one of his guards named Mordecai. And so in the middle of all of this, there's a plot uh, from some people who work for Xerxes to overthrow him and to assassinate him. Mordecai and Esther help to stop this when they find it out. Uh, and for some reason or another, uh, Xerxes' advisors decide that uh, he hates Mordecai. And so therefore, uh, this advisor, Haman, decides that he is going to ask Xerxes to help him murder all of the Jews in Persia. So Haman convinces Xerxes, uh, without very much detail, to give him permission to pay mercenaries and mercenary armies to commit this genocide, really, all throughout Persia. Uh, and then he rolls a die to figure out uh, when this attack will occur. And so Mordecai and Esther find out about this plot, uh, and Mordecai encourages Esther to use her newfound status to convince the king to stop Haman's plot. And so it says in Esther that she prays and she fasts and she asks Mordecai to get the Jewish community in the city to do the same so that she can have the courage to confront the king and to save her people. And so that is when we get to chapter seven, our reading for today, uh, where it begins and the part of the story uh, where Esther is using her cunning and her charm. Uh, we see in a little before this that she can't just burst into the king's court. She can't just make accusations against Haman. And so instead, she follows the customs of the day. She invites Xerxes and Haman over to her part of the palace for a big feast. She's following the custom of the time, and so she wines and dines them, and then she asks them back for a second feast the next night. And throughout all of this, Xerxes is telling her that he will give her whatever she wants, including half of his kingdom, half of the Persian Empire. And Haman is lauding himself for being invited into this inner circle. And so finally during dinner on the second night, she makes her request. And so in Esther chapter 7, verses 3 to 5, Esther says, If I have won your favor, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me. This is my petition and the lives of my people. That is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. 
If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have held my peace, but no enemy can compensate for this damage to the king. See, she knows that the king is madly in love with her and that he doesn't realize what he has agreed to by allowing Haman to move forward with this plot. Not only does it hurt her and her people, but she tells him that it will damage him as the king. And so, of course, when he hears this, he's incensed. He has no idea what's going on. He asks who has done all of this to Esther and to him. And then Esther reveals that it is Haman. Uh, and then we skip these verses, but a little later, Xerxes sees Haman talking to Esther alone, uh, which was not allowed. And so with all of this, he has Haman killed and put on display to disgrace him, to shame him and his family. Uh, ironically, on the same uh, poll that Haman had prepared to do the same thing to Mordecai. And again, we skip some of these verses uh, for the reading for today, but after all of this happens, Xerxes then gives everything that was Haman's, all of his land, all of his wealth, to Esther, and she shares it with Mordecai. And then the last few chapters of Esther are Mordecai enacting uh, Purim, which is a Jewish festival that is still celebrated today. Uh, and so I, again, I definitely recommend that you uh, read this story in its entirety. It's so interesting <laughs> and we can't cover all of it in one sermon. But for our purposes for today, the question that I want us to answer is what can we learn from this story about God's wisdom, especially when God isn't even specifically mentioned by name in this book of the Bible. And that's also why I think that the series is called Uncommon Wisdom, because you wouldn't think that you could glean anything about God's wisdom if God is not mentioned. But just because God is not mentioned doesn't mean that God is not present. Uh, if you've been around the United Methodist Church for a while, I hope you've heard this term that we use called provenient grace. In Methodist theology from the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, we have uh, these three means of grace with provenient grace being the first or the grace that goes before. And this theological idea uh, behind provenient grace is that God's grace is always with us even before we are aware of it, that God's presence, the Holy Spirit, God's wisdom and love and compassion and everything else are always present with us. And that God gives us this gift of grace freely without asking for anything in return and that there is nothing that we can do or not do to earn that grace or to have that grace removed from us. So even though God is not specifically named in Esther, we know, we see, we read that Esther is a woman of faith. She stays true to her Jewish identity. And we know that she acts in ways that are consistent with God's ways of standing up for oppressed peoples and doing what is right in the face of danger. We see Esther using wisdom in how she approaches Xerxes, how she wins his favor, how she follows the right customs and uh, to make sure that he is going to hear her when she asks for justice. She uses what little power she has to do what is right and ends up saving thousands of people from the hatred of one man. And we also see the contrast to wisdom uh, in both Xerxes and Haman. In the story, Xerxes is clearly motivated by power and lust and can only see whatever is right in front of him. It really doesn't seem like he can see past the moment that he is in to know the consequences of his own decisions and actions, which is an incredibly dangerous fault in someone with so much power. And then we see Haman, who is motivated by pride and by hatred, because the whole reason that he wants to commit genocide against an entire peoples is because one man would not bow to him. Mordecai refuses to bow to Haman when Haman is put in a position of power. And so Haman decides that that's worthy of annihilating an entire peoples. We've learned over the last few weeks that wisdom is so much more than knowledge. 
that wisdom is an understanding of right and wrong, of deeper meanings of the consequences of our decisions and our actions. And to me, that says that wisdom doesn't just lie in our head, but in our heart and in our gut and in our spirit. We see Esther using wisdom to do what is right, to save her people from the ignorance and the greed and the hatred of others. And unfortunately, it feels like uh, not too much has changed in that regard from this time. Uh, Things are certainly much better in many ways for us than they were in the 400s BCE, right? But uh, human nature really isn't all that different. In another book of of wisdom literature that I love, uh, Ecclesiastes, it says that there is nothing new under the sun. We know that human beings have been selfish and greedy and oppressive and violent since the beginning of human beings. And that we still see that today with so much violence and divisiveness and hatred, so much willful ignorance and like Haman, these overreactions to a perceived slight And yet, we also have glimpses of Esther's among us, hopefully of a little bit of Esther within us as well. I feel like uh, there are times when we get jaded, uh, especially now, (laughs) and especially when we see all of this in the news, all this greed and violence and ignorance, and it feels like that will win out. But then I read things like this story of Esther and it gives me another glimpse of hope because I think it gives us a glimpse into God's grace. I'm reminded that change is possible, that salvation comes from God, not from people, and that ultimately God's justice will be done. So hopefully this helps us to continue to have hope that maybe this time change can happen, that maybe this time we can move the needle just a little bit more towards justice. Maybe this time we can help make a difference for even just one person and to help others to understand this love and this grace that comes from God. Esther does the hard thing. She stands up for herself and for her people in an impossible situation. She does what is right, and she is able to change the fate and save the lives of thousands of people. Most of us will likely not be in this exact position, right? Very few uh, people get to be queens anymore. But most of us, in some way, hold some kind of power. We have at least some privileges. And we have the opportunity to make a difference, whether it be for one person or for thousands of people. And when we rely on God's wisdom, on God's grace, on God's love, when we seek to do what is right and just and loving, then we are able to find God's wisdom. And we won't always know. We won't always be sure. We won't always succeed, but we keep trying. We keep holding on to God's hope because the hope that comes from God is eternal. I want to uh, close with a story of a version of Esther that uh, I watched for this. There are a lot of movie versions of Esther, not all of them uh, great (laughs) or true to the story, Uh, but one of them that I actually really enjoy and think is helpful is the VeggieTales version. So if you don't know what VeggieTales is, it's an animated kids show that tells Bible stories with talking fruit and vegetables. There's lots of singing and uh, silliness. Uh, But I loved VeggieTales growing up. And so when I was preparing for today, I knew there was this version. And so I decided to sit down for the 30 minutes to watch it. Uh, And it stays pretty true to the story and uh, makes it easy for kids to understand. And in this version, Mordecai, who was played by uh, Pa Grape, tells Esther over and over again, you never have to be afraid to do what's right. Because in this story, she's asking, why me? She didn't choose to be in this position. She was literally kidnapped (laughs) and forced to become the queen. 
And she's afraid that the king won't hear her, that she'll offend him, that she'll be punished. But she does it anyway. She does what is right, knowing that God is with her, knowing the hope and the grace and the wisdom that comes from God. And so let us do the same. When we are faced with a difficult decision or situation, let us choose wisdom, to choose love, to choose to do what is right and just. We can have courage in the face of fear as Esther did, and we can make a difference in this world, in someone's life, in the lives of many, through the Holy Spirit. When we come from a place of love, when we seek God's justice and not our own justice, when we seek kindness and love mercy and humility, as it tells us in Micah 6, 8, then we can make a difference. We can help bring about God's kingdom of love and justice to this earth as it is in heaven. We never need to be afraid to do what is right. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to seek your wisdom, your love, your justice, whenever we are faced with a difficult decision or situation, whenever we are asked to do what is right, even and especially when it is the harder thing to do. Help us to approach everything from a place of love and grace as you do with us so that we can do the right thing. We want to be people who help instead of harm, who do good, who work for justice, who make a difference in the lives of your people and your creation. Guide us with your wisdom, we pray. Amen. As we close this time together, let us remember that God's wisdom and grace and love is always with us. And that even in the face of difficult situations or difficult decisions that we can do what is right. We never be, need to be afraid to do what is right because God is with us. So let us go in peace to love and serve God and our neighbor. Amen.